the occasion of our conversation is that you have this wonderful new book coming out, Being You, um, and you've been kind of leading researcher in consciousness uh, science for a long time. Um, what led to you writing this book now? It seemed about time, frankly. I, it's, I think I'd been having this itch for a while that I hadn't in one place collected all the various things that I'd been thinking over the last 20 years or so that I've been working broadly in the area of consciousness science. And um, I just got frustrated that, that yeah, publishing papers, individual papers, or even public engagement things like writing the article here and there or giving a, giving a talk was only little bits, wasn't the full picture. And part of the reason I wanted to write the book was to get the full picture across, but the other part of it was to figure out, well, what is that full picture? What, what do I really think? How do all these things fit together? It's only when you try to put things together that you actually realize what the full story is. So it was really educational for me as well to basically figure out what I thought about things. Yeah, I mean, you've done lots of amazing public engagement work. And I've, I've found it for myself that in doing that work, actually, I tend to come up with new insights and just stepping back and reframing everything from scratch to a, you know, to a lay person who has no context. I find that really is, is clarifying. Did you have a similar experience from writing this? Absolutely. And it, 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 that generalizes to all the public engagement stuff that I've done. It's something that I'm you know, quite keen uh, to the people in my group and people I you know, talk to, to, to tell them uh, public engagement is not just about, you know, one directional feed of information that you disseminate to, to the wider public. It's, it's both a two way thing. I mean, I've, I've learned a lot from dialogues that have been sparked and, and discussions and collaborations that have been sparked way outside the tram lines of my own uh, neuroscientific research. And, and also, yes, by explaining, by trying to explain something in a way that you can get the key points across, it really reveals, firstly, if you don't understand it very well yourself, um, and it forces you to, to really get to the core of what it is. And I think that, that stripping things down is very helpful. It, it makes it clear when you've just been relying on jargon, whether you've realized it or not before. Right. And I guess in the spirit of that, of kind of starting at the beginning and stripping things down, maybe if we begin with your definition of how you think about consciousness, just so everyone's up to, you know, on the same page as we as we go into your, your thoughts on the topic. Yes, that's a good way to put it. I think definitions of consciousness are, are best used to stay on the same page rather than being offered right. as some you know, real truth or, or something that any individual is particularly attached to, uh, you know, partly because definitions evolve. You know, there's no, definitions change as our understanding change, and that's how things should be. So my starting point to ensure that we don't talk past each other is derived from the philosopher Thomas Nagel, which is that for a conscious organism, there is something it is like to be that organism. There's something it's like to be me, something it's like to be you. There's probably nothing it's like to be a table or a chair or uh, a book or a paperclip. Um, for a bat, maybe yes. For an octopus, probably yes. You, know, you get the idea. There are some things for which the status might be unclear, but for a conscious organism, there is some kind of subjective experience going on that's the key thing it's not the same thing as intelligence it's not uh, the same thing as having a self or the experience of being a self it's the presence of any kind of what you what in philosophy you might call phenomenal experience there is something it is like to be a conscious system right and then you've taken this kind of experimental scientific approach to understanding consciousness which I think you know maybe a good place to go next is the hard problem because you're you're kind of intrinsically coming up against that right by studying the material basis of consciousness in the brain through neuroscience there's this this famous uh, problem which maybe you could articulate but then also your your stance that that of what the the real problem is that uh, we should be thinking about yes yeah, so i called it the real problem partly as a sort of informal dig at the hard problem friendly dig at the hard problem the heart problem has been 
the modern incarnation of this very old divide in philosophy and in common thinking as well between mind stuff and matter stuff. Uh, a lot of people trace it back to Descartes. The hard problem version of it is due to David Chalmers, uh, a very, very well-respected philosopher of mind. And in defining the hard problem, uh, Chalmers is basically saying that, or driving the intuition that materialist explanations, that is to say, explanations about physical interactions among elements, mechanisms, if you like, will never explain why uh, there is anything like conscious experience at all in the universe. Um, he distinguishes the hard problem from the so-called easy problems. And the easy problems are not easy in the sense of being simple to solve. They're easy in the sense that there is no conceptual mystery that some kind of explanation in terms of mechanisms is up to the job. So we can think of the brain as a mechanism. It's very complicated, but it's still a mechanism of physical parts and so on, neurons and electrical fields and all this stuff. Uh, how does it work? How does it actually transform sensory input into motor output? How does it work as a mechanism? These are easy problem questions. Not easy, but they, there's no conceptual obstacle there. The hard problem is how and why any of this physical processing, processing should give rise to any kind of subjective experience whatsoever. As Chalmers puts it, it seems unreasonable that it should, and yet it does. We are conscious. We have conscious experiences, though some philosophers will take issue with that and say, actually, we're mistaken about the way in which we think that we have conscious experiences. I take conscious experiences as a kind of given. You know, I want to know, you know, I have an experience which is composed of many different things going on at the moment. There's a difference between being anesthetized and being awake and aware. There's something there. Um, and so Chalmers is really arguing that, uh, or the usual way to interpret Chalmers is that However far you get in solving the easy problems, the hard problem is going to remain untouched and pristine and will be as deeply mysterious as it seems to us today. Um, this may be true. You know, I have some sympathy with this idea that physical explanations will not fully resolve the mystery of consciousness. But I don't think it's a given. And I think dividing the problem space this way into easy and hard problems is not the most productive route to follow. Uh, so what I call the real problem is the problem of trying to explain and predict things about conscious experiences, the experiential subjective properties of conscious experiences in terms of mechanistic processes in the brain and body. Think of it as building explanatory bridges between things happening in brains and things happening in our conscious experience. Uh, this is not the hard problem because it's not trying to answer the question, why and how is consciousness part of the universe at all? How, you know, what's the magic stuff that generates it from the mechanism? It's not trying to answer that question. And it's not the easy questions either because we're really not interested just in the functions of mechanisms, but in why is the experience of redness different from the experience of jealousy or the experience of the taste of cheese? Uh, these are all different kinds of conscious experiences. They have different qualities, um, but we can begin to account for those differences in terms of mechanisms. And that's, that's a way to address the real problem. And the hope is, my hope is, and my belief is on good days, that pursuing this line won't solve the hard problem, but it will dissolve the hard problem that once we have the ability to explain and predict and control why our conscious experiences are the way they are in terms of the brain, then the hard problem mystery just either will seem much less mysterious or won't seem mysterious at all. And the historical analogy for this, of course, is vitalism, that at one point not that long ago, people thought that life could not be explained mechanistically. And now... We don't understand everything about life, but there is no conceptual mystery to it being so expli explicable. Vitalism is not a sort of, it's, it doesn't have currency anymore. The, the, um, the hard problem of life wasn't solved, it was dissolved. It went away 
when biologists try to explain the properties of living systems individually and collectively. Life is not the same thing as consciousness, but I think the historical parallel is, is illuminating.